Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. And remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Cause your grace is enough. So who am I that you are mindful of me, that you heal me when I call? And is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. So who am I that you are mindful of me? That you heal me? Yeah, when I call. And is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me It's amazing So amazing I am a friend of God I am a friend of God Oh, oh I am a friend of God He calls me friend Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? And is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, so amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. You call me friend. I am a friend of God.
God Almighty, the Lord of glory, you have called me friend. God Almighty, the Lord of glory, you have called me friend. It's amazing, so amazing, I am a friend of God. seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. 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 I want to thank y'all for being here this morning, especially those that are returning for the, the final session of our love con of our marriage conference. For those that attended Friday and Saturday, how great was that marriage conference? Amen. 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 We want to thank y'all for praying for, for those couples, those married couples that they attended the uh, marriage conference. Um, but let me start off this way. I want to welcome you to Believers Fellowship for those of you in service. If you're brand new, if this is your first time, or it's been a while since you've been here, uh, there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. I'd ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. We'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. And so with that welcome card, we're not asking for a lot of information. We're not going to show up at your door. We're not going to say you information. We're not going to tell you about your soon upcoming expired car insurance. We just want to uh, get to know you a little bit more about some upcoming events. So that welcome card is, again, is in the, in the seat back in front of you. You could drop it in the offering receptacle at the end of the service. And again, we'd love the opportunity to meet you and put a free gift in your hand. For those joining us online, great to have you here this morning. Before we get into the scripture reading, what is going to be 1 Corinthians 13, let's go ahead and stand up and greet those that are around us. Amen, amen, amen. All right, Believers Fellowship, stress the fellowship. Let's go ahead and return to our seats and remain standing. Let's go ahead and return to our seats. And if you could remain standing as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, and this is God's word. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my positions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures 
all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are gifts, if there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. And that's God's word. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father, and we thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy, Father. We thank you that you first loved us, Father, and sent your son to die for our sins, Father. And Father, right now, Father, I just pray, Father, that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Father. I pray that during this time, Father, that you just reveal your face to us, Father. And Father, I just pray, Father, that you just block out the noise and the distractions of the world, Father, so that we can truly sit at your feet, Father. I pray for those that, are, that don't know you, and I pray for those that are running from you, Father, that you re reveal yourself to them, Father, that they hear your call, Father, that you want to call them your friend, Father, and we thank you and praise you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Just as you are Don't you hear The Spirit call Come just as you are Oh come and see Come and see Come receive Come receive Come and live Come and live Forever Just as you are, don't you hear spirit call? Come just as you are, so come and see, come and see, come receive, come, receive. come and live. Just as you are, don't you hear the Spirit call? Come, just as you are, come and see. Come and 
Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? All will see how great. How great is our God? He stands, and time is in his hand, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. You are worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great is our God. So, Lord, you may be seated. Let me give you another welcome. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. Excited uh, about today's services. As Gary had shared with you, we're just also wrapping up our, our weekend conference on, on marriage. And the title of the conference was uh, Only Love Matters. When it really gets down to it, that's what it takes to have a relationship in the world. We are living in such a unique time and period where uh, love is probably the most forgotten term. Now, it's still used, but it's not used in the context of what the Bible intended it to be used. We, we get uh, love and that word completely confused with other terms. We, we talked about in our conference the fact that the, the Greeks were really 
well at defining these terms of love. In American language, in English language, we have this word love. The Greeks had a word that was agape, which we review in church. You know, that's that godlike love. That, that's that in spite of love, all right? And then there was uh, the eros, which was erotic, sensual, lust, all right? And then there was uh, the phileo, which has to do with uh, the word like philanthropist or philanthropy, a, a, people, a lover of, of people in general. And then there's the word storgy, uh, that's interesting terminology in Scripture. Uh, and in fact, the Bible describing the end time says that people would be ostorgy without that kind of love. And that kind of love is, is defined like family, mother, son, father, son, child, daughter. It's, it's people who've been put in your life that you had no choice over. <laughs> and through time and through relationship, you've committed you know, it's not like you had a choice of a husband or a wife there. It's like you, that's where you were born. That's who your parents were. And even in church, you joined that church, and there's a storge love that we accept each other's it's family, God's family. But the love we really love with is the deeper love, the agape love. And so uh, as we understand that agape love, that love, the definition we gave at the conference was uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a choice for someone else's highest good. And that's the choice that Jesus made. You know, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That God loved us with that kind of love. That's that, that's that John 3, 16 love. But the beautiful part about that for believers is, in Romans 5, that God has placed that love, it says in that chapter, in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So that when you became a believer in Christ Jesus, God gave you his love, but not only shared his love with you, he literally gave you the ability to love that way, uh, that, that unique capability. Otherwise, we're just bound by the, the, this old flesh and this old sin that's in our, that's in our flesh, and we're, we're bound by that, and that's a life of selfishness. I just shared a little bit in the conference, so let me just kind of wrap this up because we, we did some really interesting st studies in, in our group, which really all just came back to this one topic of, of really loving. But the context here is that this kind of in spite of love, this kind of love that really is concerned for someone else's highest good has been lost in the culture. The Hebrew concept of, of, of man in, in, as, a, is, as man is different from the concept that kind of flows out of the Greek philosophers or, or even the age of enlightenment. Uh, the Hebrew concept is that man is communal. That's the biblical concept. And when God created Adam and Eve, there was only one person there in the garden. The Bible tells us that, that, that she was in him. And so when God came to that place in creation, he takes her out of him, takes the rib, and, and fashions her. It's interesting that when God spoke to Adam uh, in, in Genesis, he's speaking to somebody that's more than just individual. It's, the, it's like the Trinity. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. And so when Eve was taken out of Adam... And then created as woman, they were joined together, and God brought them together, the first marriage service that was ever performed in the Garden of Eden, and made them that one, even though they were separate now. That's the Hebrew concept. It's, 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 it's commitment. It's, it's community. It's communal in, in, its, in, its, in its concept. But also, what came out of, uh, out of the Greek culture was something completely different. Uh, the Greek culture presented an idea that's very popular today, which is pretty much just humanism in the context, is that really what's important is not community or the other. What's important is you. And the, and the mindset is, is filtered into the church even with taking scriptures like, you know, you should love your neighbors, you love yourself, and making sure, you know, that you have to love yourself first before you can love your neighbor. That's not what the Bible says. All right, that's not the concept. That's not the idea that's being communicated in that passage. The idea is that we naturally love ourselves. Now it's not natural to, do, to love others. Now you choose to love others like you love yourself. And that's where a lot of people struggle. That's where the, the conflict is because, the, you know, it's all about me. It's this age of selfism. And the reason that, that people's lives are so empty, even though they have relationship after relationship after relationship, because they've never discovered this, this concept of biblical love, what true love is. It's, a, it's, it's not selfish, it's selfless. The culture, on the other hand, says, you know, take care of you. You've got to have your me time. You've got to take care of you. Take care of you first. Take care of you before all others, you know. And, and even the, the music industry, if you watch this, whether it's country, pop, or whatever, it even shares this idea. If you just follow the, all, all, the breakup songs used to be, you know, somebody broke my heart, now I'm, I'm, I'm brokenhearted. And now they're, I'm, I'm brokenhearted, and, and I hope you die. 
<laughs> That's kind of kind of the heartbeat. Isn't it? You just go look at them and you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, uh, I thought I'd be lost without you, and now I'm so much better, kind of thing. You know, uh, so the whole philosophy of the age is is so so uh, contaminated with this self love mindset and this care of self over everything else. You can't have a good marriage that way. And that's why so many marriages end up in divorce, because it's all about what can you do for me? It, it, it's what can I get out of the relationship? But what I want to focus on today, and if you missed all that and you'd like to have some more information on that, you are so blessed because we have one more conference weekend, all right? Uh, we had the f one here this weekend, and we're having the second one out at Magnolia. It's only about 35 minutes from here, you know, so you can go out to Magnolia. Go online at bfchurch.com, sign up for the event. And uh, I think we have close to 30 couples signed up out there already. Some people heard how good it was. We only had like 23 a couple of days ago that after the conference, people started talking. I, I need to go to that and get, get my life in there. So come out and be a part of the conference. You can sign up online. But the, it was really, the heart of it is just understanding the real power of what it really means to be a lover, to really love people, this agape kind of love. And, and this is a message not just for, for people who are married today. This is a message for, for the world. It's a message for the church especially. Uh, we, have, we live such isolated lives. I mean, we can't even get committed to a lift group because we're so individual, you know. But that's not Christianity. Christianity is communal. It's, 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 we want to be a part of other people's lives. We, we give ourselves. It's, it's, it's the passion of a heart of somebody whose heart is filled with the, the love of God. We need to connect. And you're only going to be happy when you connect. And then when you start giving from yourself in that relationship on every level. But today's message is the power of love because I don't believe really people get a, can get a grip on just how powerful the love that God's given us really is and the impact that it truly makes in people's lives. The Bible tells us, as I mentioned a while ago, that in the end times, people would be lovers of their own selves. All right? They're focused on that. And it goes on that same verse. says, then they were without natural affection. Natural affection there is that word storge. It's the negative of it, astorge. Kind of like a theist or somebody believes in God, a atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. The ostorgy, they're without this family. I mean, they, they, they won't choose to love people. Uh, and, and, and that can be in their own home. It can be in the community. It can be in the world in general. But isn't that the culture that we're, we're just living in? Everybody is critical and everybody else. It just seems we're living in an age of judgment. I mean, we got all these avenues and venues and, and, and programs that we can get on and just put everybody straight in our mind, and we can yelp it or TikTok it or, you know, Facebook it or e-message it or whatever it might be, but we, we have to let our opinion be known and how right we are and how wrong everybody else is, and we're, we're judge and jury and, and executioner all at one time because we've forgotten what it really means to love people and have a humble heart that reaches out and involves people and, and includes people. In times of pressure especially, this is so misunderstood. In times of pressure, those seem to be the times when families divide and marriages divide and homes break up and churches fall apart. And, you know, things just, the tension brings uh, such, a, such a hardship to the relationship that people can't endure the, the pressure that, that's put upon them. And, in, and when you're living in a culture that's like this, it is all the more important to understand what Jesus meant when he said, a house that builds us, that's built upon the sand is not going to stand. But a house that's built upon the rock will survive. And not only will survive, will flourish. And the winds will come, the storms will come, the floods will come, but it's not going to fall. Why? Because there's this presence of God and there's this agape, this love of God that is present in that relationship. So what, sh what seems to be the pressure of the culture that divides us, for the believer, those pressures should be the things that push us even closer together. In a Christian marriage, the pressure comes, it should be pushing us closer together. In a Christian church, it should be pushing us closer together. So that there's more strength even in the midst of the process, but we just have failed to comprehend the depth, the concept, and the power that love can bring into a relationship. So I want to just share with you a little bit from 1 Corinthians 13 that Gary read from a while ago and kind of lay some things out for you this morning on, on the power of love. And 1 Corinthians 13 is the perfect place to go. This song, somebody's going to have to follow me along back there because it's not working. Either that or click on it once. All right, let's see if it's working now. Nope. All right, here we go. Let me just read this passage to you again. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, if I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Verse 3, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Let's just stop right there, all right? Now, catch what he's saying. If I had the, the ability to, 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 if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, now, he's writing to the Corinthian church here. The Corinthian church was very similar to the church in the Western Hemisphere today. Just surrounded with such ungodliness, lots of immorality, prostitution houses on every corner, uh, homosexuality was rampant. Un it was just, everywhere you went, it was just, it was a, it was a dark culture that you went in. Now, the, the Corinthians were, were, were Greeks, all right? And they had been run out from, by the Romans, overthrown back in 149 B.C., about 100 years later, they've come back. They re-inhabited in the area and rebuilt their city. And so Paul has come there, and he's preached the gospel, and he sees what thing, what's going on. He starts the church, and then he leaves to go build the other churches, but he, he writes to them, and he, he writes not just one letter to them. He writes two letters to them on how they should live their lives and conduct their, their, their affairs of their life in, in the present kind of ungodly environment, culture they were in, how to do it powerfully and how to do it significantly and how their life could be important and have significance in it. And so as he writes this letter, he said, listen, and he points out to something they're very clear with. They're the Greeks. It's Demosthenes and Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. These were all Greek philosophers they were all familiar with. And Paul is saying, hey, if I had their tongues, if I could speak like they speak, if I had the power to, to sway vast crowds of people with my, my oratory, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. And he really contends that, you know, that the world, that this, any oratory in the world, if it doesn't have love, is really nothing. It's nothing apart from love. The reverse of that is true. The humblest person whose words are spoken with love, who is not an orator, who doesn't have the ability to speak great words, their names are, are, are great. Their, their lives are great. It's their, their lives are more significant than those names that we just mentioned that are emblazoned on all the headlines of the day and all the philosophers of the day. And Paul, Paul uses his words, hey, even if I could do that, if I could speak with the tongues of men and angel, you know, if I could do great things with my ability to speak, and there's a lot of people who have the capacity to speak and sway crowds. He said, if I have all that, but I don't have love, I'm just, it's, I'm, he used this word, nothing, but it's a word that really means worthless. If I don't have love, I, I have no value whatsoever. Now think of that. I mean, just think of it like this. If you have a very tiny amount of something, if it's just a little, maybe it's money. You can at least measure it, right? When Paul says here, nothing, let me tell you what he's saying. Even though you can, you Socrates, Plato, or who any other great philosopher, if you don't have love, your life is, uh, you're pretty much an incapable person. No matter how well you can speak, no matter how good you look, no matter how good your, your, your stick is, you know, your, 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 your talk, whatever it might be, your, your swag, it's nothing. You're like just an incapable person without love. This psychiatrist uh, by the name of A.A. A. He, he says that love is necessary to survival. It is quite as essential for a person to have love as to have pure air and food to sustain him. Now, let me tell you the one thing that's wrong with that context. Um, last Sunday, I shared with you the four things that people want in life to make them happy and how that, that, that no matter where you you, you, you ask Siri or Google or whatever, Wikipedia, whoever, these four things always topped up the top of the line. It was acceptance and security and approval and respect. Those are the things that, that people want and they're looking for. But in reality, that's not going to bring you happiness or life either. It's, it, your life is empty because that's, it's, not, it's not about, as in the context of the article, it's not about getting that stuff that's going to make you happy. And people spend their whole life trying to get stuff to make them happy, but they're never happy. And what Brill's saying here in his comment, he's saying, you know, uh, love is such a necessary thing. It's quite essential to have love, uh, to have pure air, uh, food sustaining. The problem with that is he's saying, he's saying the same thing as that these other humanist psychiatrists and psychologists are coming at it from. That is to say, you've got to get something from, from someone else to be happy. You, you need love, you know. But it's not that you need love. You need to love. And that's, this is the whole concept of what Jesus is saying that's so contrary to the world, you know, that we, we sit around, all we need is love, love, love is all you need. Hey, all you need to do is give love. That's what you need, you know. What the world needs now is, uh, back record, it was love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just to. 
Oh, y'all sound good. Too little of. But the, the deal is it's the too little of it because nobody's giving it. It's not a matter of receiving it because there's a beautiful principle in the Word of God that says this. And it's written in multiple places. Jesus said it. Paul repeated in Galatians. Uh, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now, whatever you give, that's what you get. You want love, you want to be loved, then start being a lover. Start giving love. And he says, if you're not, you can get all this love of the woman, but you're still nothing. You know? You're still nothing until you learn how to, to be a lover. Life is value, valueless until we start investing it and giving it and sharing it and communicating with other people. The value of love is, is it probably can't even be measured in reality as what God can do in a life that learns how to, to do this. So this. The second thing about I want to say for this text is the test of love. You can go to the next slide. The test of love is, listen to these scriptures here. Verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag and it's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account wrong suffered. So, the next two verses. Verse 6 says, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is the, the, the real test of love. Is it real love? Then if it is real love, well, just go to that next slide because there's a couple things that will be, that'll be popped up. Go ahead and click each one of those. There's four there that I want you to quick, click on. But love is suffering, he says. Love, it, love it, it suffers long. That means it's, it's, it doesn't mean I, it has to, means, has to do with being even-tempered in the midst of difficult circumstances. Not, put it this way, not flying off the handle. Not having to get your two cents in to get your your sarcastic moment expressed, your criticism declared. It's patient, enduring. It says that love is kind. This is a word literally has to be a warm-hearted, considerate, humane, gentle, sympathetic person. Again, that's not natural to us. This is what God gives us through the presence of his Holy Spirit in our life, all right? There's an article that was written years ago in Chicago Daily News entitled Love Working Miracles for the mentally ill in Kansas, and it's basically just talking about people who are deal, dealing with intellectual impairments. These particular doctor was saying that you can have all these therapies and surgeries and group stuff and drugs and all the things, but the greatest part that played for healing in any individual that we saw experience real turnarounds in their life was love. You, 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 can't, you can't whip that up in a pill, you know. You, you, can't, you can't have a little formula that you, you, you apply to it. It's just this, this, this patience, this suffering long, this kindness to people. He said, love doesn't envy is that third point. It, it, it envies not. Now, what is the word here for envy? Some, some books say jealousy, but it means to literally the, the Greek dictionary would put it this way. Painfully desires of another's advantages. As we say, the New American Standard puts this word, love is not jealous. Saul, Solomon, what we call the wisest man, he was something who knew about jealousy in his life. In Song of Solomon 8, 6, he said, jealousy is as cruel as the grave. In fact, jealousy is one of the true enemies of what it really means to love. Because if I'm not jealous, then I'm rejoicing with you in what God's given you or what you've been blessed with, even if I don't have it. Real love knows nothing of this selfishness attitude which says, I need what they have will put the welfare of others before yourself. In your marriage, now you're starting to put the welfare of your spouse above yourself. Now it's that where we say in that definition that it's, it's, it's making decisions and sacrifices and commitments, paying the cost, whatever it is, for someone else's highest good. And if you were in the conference, we talked about how that always pays dividends back to the giver. God always blesses that. And, you know, if we, we lose that, then we're not constantly putting somebody else's affairs above ours, then, then it's just the opposite. There's, there's these things, arrogance and bragging and self-seeking and self-provoking and holding grudges and coming out of coming out as that selfish person. That's all just the heart of, of the culture we live in, to take care of yourself first. Number four, he said, love bears all things. The word here is a verb which means to endure something unpleasant or difficult whether it's on your own behalf or behalf of someone else. There's another passage that puts it like this, love covers a multitude of sins. 
There's this word over here we used here that love suffers long. That has to do with patience. This has to do with enduring. This is the context. I'm going, I will put up with this. I'll take this. I'll tolerate this. I, and, but not only will I tolerate I love the person. It's not something that I prefer. It's not something I want. But hey, I love them enough to forgive them. I love them enough to receive them. I love them enough to, to accept them. Now, if you want a little test of this, a little exercise of this, you could go back to those verses where it says uh, uh, in, in uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and just put your name there instead of scratch out the word love. We don't literally do it, but put your name there. Joe suffers long. Sue is patient. Bob is kind. Whatever your name is. I envy not. Your name bears all things. That might be a little difficult. That's where, we're, that's where we can measure ourselves, though. It's a way in which God gives us to really see are we, are we making a decision. But hey, it takes, it takes a commitment. You know, I, I've never understood by, uh, by some people, they want to come to the altar and get married, and they want the benefits of marriage, you know. Sex, usually, number one. But as I said last weekend, this last weekend, it, you know, marriage is not legalized prostitution, okay? It's <laughs> legalized adultery. So that's that's it's that's wonderful aspect of marriage and it's an important aspect of our marriage but the truth of our marriage is that we're always giving you know not just physically in some regards sometimes it's emotional sometimes it's deep sometimes it even hurts but we're willing to receive and and and, and as we said take no account of the wrongs that have been suffered but that's the that's the glory of God's love and that's where, again most people don't want to go there because they know it's going to cost them something but if that's, your, if that's your reason for not going there, that means you have chosen not to love. So, well, Brother Joe, I just don't love her or I don't love him anymore. You know, we fell in love back in whatever it was, but we're just, we're just you know, we fall out now. You don't fall in, you don't fall out. You choose to love or you choose not to love. That's that simple, right? That's it. That, that's the simplicity of it all. And as we said, and we talked about the qualities of love in our first session in the marriage conference, it goes into what that really means in our life. The third point I want to show you here, if you bring that for me, Sophia, uh, it, from the passage uh, of 1 Corinthians, verses 8 through 13. He says, love never fails, but their gifts of prophecy, they'll done away. If their tongues, they'll cease. If there's knowledge, it'll be done away with. For we know in part, we only prophesy in part, verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully also that I, as I have been fully known. Now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And he writes these words in that verse 8, love never fails. You may be sitting back and say, well, it's just not going to work. Love never fails. Well, what's my guarantee? The Bible says love never fails. And in fact, when, as we were answering questions, one of the questions came up and says, you know, uh, I want to do the right thing. I just don't think I'm capable of doing the right thing and, and, and loving like that. That's where you trust the Lord, and that's where you have faith that, that God's going to move. You have faith in what he said, that love doesn't fail. And the beautiful part about that is even the Scriptures goes on and tells us that, hey, Faith operates by love. Because I love God, I choose to follow God. That's faith. Because I love God, I choose to do what God's called me to do. That's faith. Because I love God, I choose to act in the way that I, I act towards my wife. And therefore, I'm expressing love. But the faith that I have that God's going to honor, that's just based on the fact that I love God. And I choose to believe that God will honor what he says that he will do. Let me put it simply. Love wins. Love is always going to win. There'll be things that lose. There's going to be defeat in your life at times. But when it comes back to everything, love never fails. Now, the older I get, though, the greater my realization comes that as I get older in life, I lose more and more abilities. Sight, balance. I mean, it just continues. It's just the, the natural course of this life, this temporal, temporal life. It doesn't last. The older you get, I mean, it's like reverting to your childhood, all right? It, and... There's going to come a day in my life when everything that I possess and everything that I'm able to do, it's not going to happen anymore. Put it this way, simply put, in case you haven't heard, we're all going to die. <laughs> and it won't matter. 
But what will matter will be the investments of loving people that you made. Investments you committed to someone else because you chose to be a lover. You chose to, to, to be faithful. You chose to honor God with your life. That goes on and on and on in people's lives. People I have loved who've gone on before me still impacting my life to this very day. People that loved me, cared for me, mentored me, instructed me, counseled me, prayed for me, their impact is still going on to love one. And love wins. And love always wins in our life. And we, uh, uh, it doesn't take a great deal of discernment to realize that we live in such an age of hate. There's such division and such hatred and such strife. And the media and the politicians, they love it. They just glory in it. Let's pick sides. Let's tell how terrible and wretched the other side is and how worthless those individuals are. And it, it has now infected very families even. Just because they're in different political parties, they can't even talk and carry on a conversation. That's tragic. We've lost the healing, beauty that love will bring in our homes, in our nation, even in our churches in, in many places. And there's this driving of wedges that keeps on going on and on and on. I can assure you with all my heart, mind, soul that that does not come from God. It comes straight out of hell. And his 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 motive, Satan's motive, has always been to steal and to kill and to destroy. But love will conquer all these things. Show me this next slide, Sophia. Love is like a bridge that connects our hearts when we're apart. The rainbow that colors our word when we're together and the bond that keeps us learning and growing together in the Lord. I don't even know where I found that, who wrote that, but I saw that years ago and I saved that little comment because it was such a... It was such an incredible, powerful word that so few people really comprehend. Choosing to love will connect our hearts. In your marriage, you want restoration, revival, renewing your marriage, this is where it all starts. You can go through 14 different steps that some marriage counselor, even a pastor, a Christian or not, is going to give you, do this, 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 and this. You know, I've preached some of those sermons telling people how to resolve conflicts in their home, you know, schedule a peace conference, all these. Those are good practical steps. But the base of it all is, is the love of God. God's given me to strengthen me, empower me, and give me the ability and you the ability to love like Jesus loved. That'll change your life. And that'll certainly change your marriage. It'll change a church. It'll change a heart. Amen. I want you to stand with me as our heads are bowed. In a moment, after this part of the service, we're going to have time for renewal of vows, and you can participate, and I'll explain that more in a moment. But before we even get there, I'm going to ask Pastor Gary to come and myself be down here, the band as they come. And just uh, we're going to just worship the Lord, take a few minutes just to get our hearts and minds set, set on him and before him, that you would just take this moment in this service just to examine your heart, uh, not to worry about anybody else's heart, <laughs> just your heart. Because if we can take care of business with ourselves, then it's amazing what God can do with us and through our lives. But if you've never given your life to Christ Jesus, you're missing out on one of the great blessings that, that Jesus died and rose from the dead to offer us, and that was the love of God. It not only forgives us of our sin, but transforms our life and gives us new life. If you've never surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ today, I'd encourage you to do that. We're going to just worship the Lord in this house today and take this time to, to get hearts right. If you, if you know your heart is you know, belongs to the Lord. Check and see how you're doing in this regard to your, your love life. Where have you been? Have you found yourself moving towards selfishness, even in your relationship with the Lord, or selflessness? God's got something he desires to do. Whenever the word is preached, the Bible said it's like seeds that are being sown, and they have an intent, and that's to bring fruit in our life, for change to come, results to happen, fullness to come. So whatever the Spirit of God has said to you today, I encourage you, to open your heart to him. If you're looking for a church home, you believe for the Lord's led you, you've been praying about it, you, the Lord's impressed this is this place you're supposed to be, come, be a part of what God's doing. Just come up and let Pastor Gary, I know, hey, I want to be a part of what God's up to here. Maybe it's just something you want us to pray with you about. Or maybe you just want to come to the altar and kneel here by yourself or maybe bring some with you to pray. Feel free to do that at this time. Well, however the Lord is leading, let's just take this moment and give this time to him as we worship him. You come. Come just as you are. 
Don't you hear spirit call? Come just as you are. So come and see. Come and see. Come receive. Come receive. Come and live. Come and live. Forever. Come just as you are. Won't you hear the Spirit call? Come just as you are. Oh, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and live. Forever, life everlasting, and strength for the day. Taste the living water, and never thirst again. Come just as you are. Well, don't you hear the Spirit call? Come just as you are. Oh, come and see. Come and see. Come receive. Come receive. Come and live. Forever, life everlasting, and strength for the day. Taste the living water, and never thirst again. Come just as you are. Won't you hear spirit call? Come just as you are. Oh, come and see. Come and see. Come receive. Come receive. Come and live. Come and live forever. Come and see. Come and see. Come receive. Come receive. Come and live. Come and live forever. Father, we praise you. We bless you. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy, your continued goodness to us, your continued grace over our lives. Continue to work in our hearts. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. There are those of you today who want to come and participate and renew your vows. I'm going to ask you to come forward in just a moment. But before I do, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Uh, some of you have been married a short time. Some of you have been married a long time. Uh, over the years, you've been hopefully learning the meanings uh, of that phrase in Scripture that says, and the two shall become one. Uh, in the presence of God, when you made those vows one to another, there was a covenant relationship that was established. It goes well beyond what the state considers your marriage. state considers your marriage as a contractual agreement. God looks at it as a covenant agreement. Uh, covenant agreement, when truly really understood, brings fullness to the relationship. It brings vitality and maturity to it. So whether you understand it or not, if you've been gathered, to, if you come together in holy matrimony like that, uh, you are one. And, but in becoming more of that one, you become really more fully yourself. And a lot of people don't understand that, and they're always seeking their, their part of the relationship, or my part, their part. No, there is no your part, my part. It's our part. We're together in this. It's, it's, and, and when we start looking at 
conflicts in marriage, problems in marriage, issues that arise in our marriage, when we realize that it's, 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 not a, it's, it's not about all the things we think it is, it's about us, what are we, how are we going to benefit from these problems we're facing? What's going to make us stronger? What's going to grow us and knit our hearts even deeper together? You've known one another. Some of you have been long enough, married long enough, you actually became friends by now. <laughs> as well as lovers, parents, comrades, and fellow workers. In so many ways, that describes your life. I'm sure that some of you have been married long enough to finish each other's sentences. Or at least to presume to know what you're thinking. <laughs> but uh, when you come to this place to renew your vows, I just want to urge you to recall the things in your experience of your marriage, no matter how many years or it has been, but recall the things that have, that have made your relationship succeed, the things that the sacrifice, the patience, the self-giving, uh, the forgiveness, the encouragement, the prayer, the humility with one another, the telling truth to one another, the willingness to accept each other just as you are and to receive one another. I think those were the greatest words I, I shared in our marriage conference, probably the most romantic words in all the scripture, when Adam said, when God presented Adam to Eve, he said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this is the reason a man shall leave his mother and his father. Shall cleave to his wife, they two shall be one. That, that, that word is just a word of acceptance of her. It was saying, and it's the same thing we do in, in marriage vows. It's basically, everything I am, I give to you. Everything you are, you give to me, and I receive you. And you receive me. So I ask you to, um, as you come in just a moment, and you just kind of keep those things in your heart and mind, and realize that the blessings and the best things of your life have always been from a source other than yourselves. And that's the grace of God and the mercy of God. So if you would like to participate this morning in the renewal of vows, I want to ask you to make your way to the front here and stand in front of me and uh, hold your wife's hands, not somebody else's. I'm going to ask you to face each other, all right, and to hold hands. I'd ask you to look down at those rings that you exchanged for just a moment there and remember the promises that were made at the exchange of rings. And I'm going to ask you just personally to take a, a moment in your own mind and heart just to look at each other and remember the day that you stood before the Lord, whether it's for a judge or in a church or some event center. And remember that day of commitment. Some way to remember the vows that you made were sacred and holy and they're enduring. The ring on the hand should serve as that continuing symbol of the vows you made. The bands representing the, the things that bond our life together. But as we come to this moment and to this part of the service, I'm going to ask the men to repeat some vows after me to your wife, looking at her. And I'll ask the ladies to follow by repeating similar pledge of recommitment. These are just reminders and renewals of what has been once said already. So as you look at each other in the presence of our family and friends that are gathered here today, you do not live in a, alone to yourselves. You're part of a larger community as always, but you are part of each other. So men, I ask you to repeat after me. I recommit myself to love you for richer or for poor, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health from this day forward. Everything I have is yours. I renew my promise to be true I renew my promise to be a faithful husband as long as my life shall last. I thank God that you're my wife and I understand the power of this pledge. And by God's grace, I will continue to fulfill it. Ladies in like manner, look at your husband. I recommit myself to love you Say it louder. I recommit myself to love you. For richer or for poor, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, from this day forward, all I have is yours. I renew my promise to be a true and faithful wife as long as my life shall last. I thank God that you're my husband. 
and understand the power of this pledge. And by God's grace, I will continue to fulfill it. Having, uh, not to repeat this part, but having reaffirmed your vows, your love, your faith in each other, acting on the authority as a pastor, it's one of the greatest churches in the world. <laughs> I, re I now repronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. <laughs> Amen. Why don't you turn and face the audience because I want to present you another time. These lives, these people made this commitment with their heart, mind, and soul to each other. As Mr. and Mrs., you know the rest. Give them a hand again, praise the Lord. Uh, you guys can be seated. God bless you. Hey, it's always fun to come to church. Amen? <laughs> praise the Lord. I'm glad that you were here to participate. If you'd like to, if you didn't make this conference, I encourage you to come. It's, it was a great conference, a great time, really laid back. I think besides just getting in, in the Word together was just the fellowship we had together. Uh, the food was great. The food was too much, probably. <laughs> But if you're invited to come out and participate, if you want to come and do another one, just sign up, all right? If you paid, uh, it's half price on the second one for you, all right? <laughs> At least cover some of your food costs. But what a blessing it was and what a blessing it is to pastor people that love each other so much and care for each other and care for their church and pastor. Amen? Brother Gear, you come. Closing now, please. So just to recap our spring campus marriage conference, it was a great time. You're going to have to give me a minute. That was, I don't know about y'all, that was pretty emotional. Well, I cry anyway, but anyway, it was, uh, oh, man, it's that, that ragweed mold is pretty high today. I don't know. But um, we had a great time at the conference. Uh, you can see back here some pictures. Uh, it was just, a, let me tell you a little secret about, so when we plan these marriage conferences, we, we have the title, but we, we don't, the three of us as pastors, we don't sit down and kind of plan like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present this and, and I'm going to present this and I'm going to present this. We don't, we don't go over each other's sermons. Uh, we, we have the autonomy through the Holy Spirit to, to uh, develop our message. And year after year when we, do, when we present, we don't bring a speaker in, but when we present, the Holy Spirit just moves. Each one of the sessions, only because of the Holy Spirit, just built I don't know if y'all noticed that or not, but it just built on each other. And, and, and that's just a praise to just Pastor Joe, Pastor Tim, to just being willing just to continue just to, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to move uh, for our church and for our people. So, but we had a great time at the conference. It is, it is not too, too late to, to be a part of that. If uh, you did not attend the spring campus, we do have our Magnolia Campus uh, Marriage Conference this Friday and Saturday. It is starting at 5.30's registration, dinner's at 6, first session's at 7. The cost is $50. If you've gone to a conference before, a retreat, $25. If you've never gone to a retreat before. Uh, and I'll tell you what, if you're a first-time visitor and you want to attend our marriage conference uh, this Friday, sign up, and I'm paying for you. I'm paying for you. So um, if you've never gone to a conference and you're a first-time visitor, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for you. And because I think I believe in it that much. Uh, and, and so it would be a blessing to have you be a part of our, our marriage conference. So you can, for more information, you can go to our website, bfchurch.com, or we have forms still out there. I think you can click on the QR code and sign up. No pressure, but to pressure you, you should, you should go. Um, because like our walk, like our walk, our marriage is the same way. We're either in a valley, getting out of a valley, or getting ready to go to another one. And so it's, it, we have to be equipped every day. As, as we put on the armor of God for our walk, we also need to put on the armor of God for our marriage. Amen? Amen. So lift tonight, that's our small group. It means living in fellowship together. We, had, we already had our morning lift group. We'll have our evening lift group. And for those in my lift group, we're not going to meet in the, in the conference room tonight. We're actually going to meet in here. So come in here. I'll have the table set up and everything like that. So come here. We start at 530. I'll make sure the air's on so that we can meet. Um, our youth and Awanas are tonight starting at 515. 
uh, our Wednesday night, we're going through the Harmony of the Gospels where we overlay each of the Gospels and we go in, in chronological order of the events of, of the, the, uh, the Gospels. Right now, we are in the Beatitudes, so you don't want to miss that Sermon on the Mount series that we're going through that Jesus preached on. And so we do that Wednesday nights at 7. Uh, save the date. We're having a men's uh, spring campus men's dinner October 14th at 7 p.m. The cost is $10. We're going to have a spaghetti dinner. It'll be a great time of fellowship, testimonies, uh, just getting together as, as men and just praying and fellowship and, and, and just hearing how God is moving in different men's lives. And so you don't want to put miss that, so put that on your calendar. October Friday, October 14th at 7 o'clock. The cost is $7. Don't forget to stay connected via Facebook, YouTube, at, and at bfchurch.com. Don't forget, oh, for our first-time visitors, here's that welcome card I was talking to you about. Uh, and so just fill this out. You can drop it in the offer receptacle, or you can bring it to me. I'd love to, love to meet you uh, over here at our, our reception outside in our foyer. My left, as you exit, it's, it's here to the left. Uh, and, and introduce you to myself, uh, meet you, and introduce you to Pastor Joe, our senior pastor. And then give you a free gift. Finally, don't forget your godly giving. Three ways to give, online, in person, or you can drop, uh, drop a check off in the receptacle, or you can drop a check off at the church Monday through Thursday. We're here from 9 to 5, but just continue to give. Amen. With that being said, any other announcements? I want to thank the band for everything. With that being said, you are dismissed.